Good morning. Welcome to Dorna Cathedral and welcome to worship on this third Sunday in Lent. Whether you're joining in at home or here in the cathedral, we're glad you are here. Thank you to Roddy and the choir for beginning worship for us this morning. Um, and some notices to share for the benefit of those um, at home, perhaps. Um, so, Natara Nosh is tomorrow, Monday at 12.30 in the West Church Hall. On Tuesday, there's a joint meeting of the Guild and the Women's Group, and the guest is um, Al McInnes from the Free Church, who will be speaking about one of the Guild projects. So, all welcome to both of these. Then, on the 1st of April, <laughs> is a coffee morning, from 10 till 12 in aid of Oversteps Activities Fund, so do come and support that. Um, the choir meets on Friday at 6 p.m. I think that's right, 6 p.m. Yeah. Um, issue three of the Parish News will be printed this week and is available next Sunday um, for the bargain price of a pound, so buy a few and share them around. And the Meeting the Bible Group, which Reverend Graham has been leading, meets on Thursday the 16th. No meeting on the 23rd, and then the last one in the series is on the 30th. So Graham will look forward to seeing you on the 16th. And those are all the notices. And if you were here last week, joining in communion, just know that I had nothing to do with Manchester United's defeat by Liverpool, okay? <laughs> and I don't have any predictions for any football matches this Sunday. <laughs> so, let's worship God. God of our present, God of this heaven-lit moment, this is the God we worship. God of the past, God of the warp and weave of our days, this is the God we praise. God of our future, God of the possibilities that beckon, this is the God we trust. Let us pray. Loving God, we come wanting to worship even though we might never be the same because of it. For you know the joys we wear on the outside, the fears we keep on the inside, and you long for us to know a gentler way to be with ourselves and others. Lord, we bring our whole selves to you in these moments a gift of love and trust in you who draws song from silence and light from darkness and peace enough for this moment. And so we pray it is, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn together this morning is number 192, all my hope on God is founded, hymn 192.
come together in our prayers of thanks and unburdening and we say together the Lord's Prayer which is in the back of the service sheet. Let's pray. In days of beauty and brokenness alike, we turn to you, Lord. In days of hope and helplessness alike, we seek your face. In days of sighing and singing alike, we listen for the word you have put in us, the word that lifts us, the word that fills us, the word that turns our gaze. Thank you, living God, for love to carry us through, for kindness when it's needed most, for mercy when we expected none. Thank you, God of our days, for welcome to bless the stranger, bless even what is strange in us, for understanding to draw us to each other. None so flawed we cannot see your face in them. Forgive us, Lord, if sometimes we are the people in our eyes. Forgive us if sometimes we fail to see the whole of which we are part. Lord, forgive us if sometimes we fight for our own small corner instead of delighting to be part of something altogether more stretching. Forgive us, Lord, and reassure us. For Jesus said, bring to me your burdens. Your deep, deep tiredness, I will give you rest. Jesus said, I am light, I am life for you. Breathe of my peace, know my fullest blessing. Lord, we thank you for these words of life. And we pray they hold and heal us. Even as we pray together, as Jesus taught his friends, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory forever. Amen. Is it any warmer down there? (laughs) It's going to come down. I think it might stay. Although I think it's colder up here. Um, We're going to listen to two readings shortly. Um, One from the Old Testament, from the book of Judges, and one from John's Gospel. These are the ones given to us today. And I'm sure that there are many here who will have grown up not just on stories about Jesus, but on Old Testament tales as well. I'm sure they're still vivid in your mind. You know the ones like Noah and his floating zoo? What others can you remember? David, maybe? The wee boy who brought down a giant with one little stone? Jonah, the reluctant prophet? bobbing about inside the belly of a big fish. Maybe even Samson, whom we meet today with his lovely locks and his superhuman strength. They were stories of great drama and great fun to tell. But the thing about so many of those stories is that as youngsters, we are by necessity told only part of the story. In some cases, whatever is palatable, or just about palatable. And there are a few things they couldn't tell us about Samson back then, when we were wee. I mean, some of us are still wee, but you know what I mean. Delilah is probably a name that you would associate with Samson, but she's not the only woman in his story. 
And perhaps she was not, as we might come to see, the villain she was made out to us. The stories which give shape to worship today have had me asking questions of the stories we tell about ourselves and about God, the stories others tell about us. Before we sing again, some lines about our story with God written by the Irish poet Porig Otwama. He says, God is a story of whatever works. God is a twist at the end and the quirks. We are the start and we are the centre. We are the characters, narrators, inventors. God is a bit that we can't explain. Maybe the healing, maybe the pain. We are the bit that God can't explain. Maybe the harmony, maybe the strain. Samson, Delilah, Jesus, the woman at the well we call Samaritan, who I've come to know this week as perhaps anxious or grieving. These are the characters we'll encounter. Perhaps you'll take them with you. Perhaps you'll go on thinking about them to hear their stories in a fuller way. For now, let's sing together hymn 212, Morning Has Broken, hymn 212. We're reading from the Old Testament, Judges chapter 16, verses 6 to 21, which can be found on page 252, Old Testament section of the Pew Bible. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me what makes you so strong. If someone wanted to tie you up and make you helpless, How could he do it? Samson answered, If they tie me up with seven new bowstrings that are not dried out, I'll be as weak as anybody else. So the Philistine kings brought Delilah seven new bowstrings that were not dried out, and she tied Samson up. She had some men waiting in another room, so she shouted, Samson, the Philistines are coming. But he snapped the bowstrings just as thread breaks when fire touches it. So they still did not know the secret of his strength. Delilah told Samson, 
Look, you've been making a fool of me and not telling me the truth. Please tell me how someone could tie you up. He told her, if they tie me with new ropes that have never been used, I'll be as weak as anybody else. So Delilah got some new ropes and tied them up. Then she shouted, Samson, the Philistines are coming. The men were waiting in another room, but he snapped the ropes, the ropes off his arms like thread. Delilah said to Samson, you're still making a fool of me and not telling me the truth. Tell me how someone could tie you up. He told her, if you weave my seven locks of hair into a loom and make it tight with a peg, I'll be as weak as anybody else. Delilah then lulled him to sleep, took his seven locks of hair and wove them into the loom. She made it tight with a peg and shouted, Samson, the Philistines are coming. But he woke up and pulled his hair loose from the loom. So she said to him, how can you say you love me when you don't mean it? You've made a fool of me three times and you still haven't told me what makes you so strong. She kept on asking him day after day. He got so sick and tired of her bothering him about it that he finally told her the truth. My hair has never been cut, he said. I have been dedicated to God as a Nazarite from the time I was born. If my hair were cut, I would lose my strength and be as weak as anybody else. When Delilah realized that he had told her the truth, she sent a message to the Philistine kings and said, Come back one more time, he has told me the truth. Then they came and brought the money with them. Delilah lulled Samson to sleep in her lap and then called a man who cut off Samson's seven locks of hair. Then she began to torment him, for he had lost his strength. Then she shouted, Samson, the Philistines are coming. He woke up and thought, I'll get loose and go free as always. He did not know that the Lord had left him. The Philistines captured him and put his eyes out. They took him to Gaza, changed, chained him with bronze chains and put him to work, grinding at the mill in the prison. Reading from John chapter 4, verses 7 to 15, on page 120 of the New Testament section of the Pew Bible. A Samaritan woman came to draw some water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink of water. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The woman answered, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan. So how can you ask me for a drink? Jews will not use the same cups and bowls that Samaritans use. Jesus answered, If you only knew what God gives and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would ask him, and he would give you life-giving water. Sir, the woman said, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get that life-giving water? It was our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well. He and his children and his flocks all drank from it. You don't claim to be greater than Jacob, do you? Jesus answered, those who drink this water will get thirsty again. But those who drink the water that I will give them will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring, which will provide them with life-giving water and give them eternal life. 
Sir, the woman said, give me that water. Then I will never be thirsty again, nor will I have to come here to draw water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Margaret. And now a meditation, a wondering, a look inside the mind of the Samaritan woman. I found myself wondering, who does he think he is? And more to the point, who does he think I am? It was a hot day to be sure, the kind of day that tugs at your throat and sticks your tongue to the roof of your mouth. The well was welcome, wells always are. It must be good to be that source of relief. People just have good things to say about you, unless of course you run dry, then blessings turn to curses. And there I was, buckets in hand, And there he was, just stood there. And I wondered, and I felt uneasy, and was determined not to catch his eye. Just do what you've come to do, I said to myself. Keep your head down. Keep yourself to yourself. Draw your water, and be on your way. I could see he was a Jew. Could he not see what I was? Give me a drink, he said. The cheek, I thought. Why do you ask, I replied. The cheek, he probably thought. But we were different peoples. I'll give you living water, he said. I paused then pressed on. You have no buckets, and wells require buckets, whatever the water is called. No pause from him. He pressed on, drink this stuff here and you will thirst again. Your throat will tug again, but my stuff will last a lifetime. A bottomless bucket, if you like. And there and then I realized he was a source of true relief. I felt an overwhelming sense of wanting to say good things about him. No man. No one had ever cared that much about me. You better not let me down. Let's join together in our prayers for others. Let us pray. Lord, it is astonishing to us that you, the God who created life from nothingness, should have been there that day, Thursday, asking for help and yet you were it's astonishing still that you the god who lay down on a cross and rose to new life should be here among us wanting our help still and it is so and so we come now with prayers for the church and for our communities and for the world and pray we hear your question your cry for help Lord we pray today for the worldwide church that it be a faithful witness to your love your presence Lord we pray for your church here in the highlands and throughout Scotland Thursday for direction for purpose wanting to be vital, wanting to be alive to the Spirit's lively leading. Lord, help us to hear your question, your cry, and let it lead us. Lord, we pray for the communities of which we are all part. We think we know them, Lord, but do we really? Do our rose-tinted spectacles or perhaps even our prejudices keep us from seeing, from welcoming, from understanding? Lord, we pray for our neighbours, thirsty for an end to loneliness, some, for a break from worry, others, for someone to listen. 
We pray for those who feel they are not coping, whose relationships are at breaking point, whose nerves are frayed. Lord, help us to hear your question, your cry, and let it lead us. We pray for our world, Lord, for people frightened or fractious, for those living in places where streets have become battlefields and pavements mortuaries, so many souls lost or in need of healing, for those who have no choice but to seek refuge in another country, that they would find safety and recovery from trauma. So many thirsty to live in peace, Lord. Help us to hear your question, your cry, and let it lead us. Lord, we pray too for those known to us whose days are difficult. We see their faces and whisper their names to you. Lord, you know their deepest need, their highest hope. Whatever they thirst for, may they know it in abundance. Lord, help us to hear your question, your cry, and let us answer through Jesus Christ, our loving Lord. Amen. Now we sing a hymn which is drawn from that story from John's Gospel in some way. It's number 722, Spirit of God, come dwell within me, hymn 722.
are the stories we tell about ourselves and the stories others tell about us. We parachuted into those encounters today. Perhaps Samson was a good guy. Perhaps he thought himself a good guy. Maybe he was. But he was also petulant and full of rage and, to put it mildly, less than respectful of the women in his life. Indeed, the story those women told about him, had they had opportunity, might not have made him the hero even of his own story. As I said before, Delilah was not the only woman in Samson's life. There were five, but Delilah is the only one to be named. First, there's his mum, known to us only as the wife of Manoah. Manoah's wife is unable to have children until she receives a visit from an angel who tells her she is to carry a son. And from before he's born, a course is set for Samson's life. The angel instructs that he's to be a Nazarite, set apart for God. He's not to drink alcohol, bartender, make his an iron brew. <laughs> he's not to eat anything unclean, no deep fried Mars bars for him, pal. And he is in bold letters not to keep the barber in business, for his locks will be the sign and the source of his God-given strength. There are the stories we tell about ourselves and the stories others tell about us. Samson's mother accepts what the angel says and tries along with Manoah to help Samuel follow the path prepared for him, which is why the second woman in his story is a source of consternation. The second woman is Samson's wife. She's also a Philistine, a member of a neighbouring but opposing tribe, which Samson makes a career of terrorising. And despite his parents' best efforts to discourage him, Samson sticks by his choice and pops the question. But it goes so very wrong, and so very quickly. His wife gets stuck in between Samson and some Philistine guests at their wedding, who are desperately trying to guess the answer to a riddle Samson has set them. Things get tense. The guests threaten to burn down her father's house and her in it unless she gets Samson to explain. She spends the first seven days of their marriage, the entire duration of the wedding feast, crying, fearing for her father's life and her own, pleading with Samson for the answer. And of course, when he finally gives in and tells her she's quick to pass the information on, Samson responds by killing some Philistines at random and then handing his wife to his best man as though something discarded. And in an age-old plot twist, he moves back in with his mum and dad. Little is known about the third and the fourth women. Samson decides he wants his wife back, but her father is having none of it. There are the stories we tell about ourselves and the stories others tell about him, about us. The father won't let Samson put his daughter's life in danger a second time. Cue the appearance of the third woman, the wife's sister, whom the father suggests as an alternative. But luckily for her, Samson walks away. Again, full of rage at not having his way, he catches hundreds of foxes, sets their tails alight, and sends him to the Philistines field of grain. The fourth woman is a sex worker whom Samson spends part of a night with. The Philistines are by now rather angry themselves. They decide to wait at the city gate ready to kill him in the morning when he makes to leave. But Samson leaves at midnight and to stick it to those who might have been dreaming of revenge, he takes the city gate off its hinges and carries it nearly as far as Inverness is to Dornoch and dumps it. Lastly, of course, there's Delilah, also likely a Philistine. Samson seems to love her, but still he toys with her. And if she loves him, it's less than obvious. Perhaps 
it's just time Samson is stopped. And perhaps she is the one to do it. Perhaps had Delilah been born in a different age, she would have joined the Me Too movement. But are the stories we tell about ourselves and the stories others tell about us. Fast forward several hundred years to the moment when Jesus and that woman lock eyes at the well. They will in that moment have heads full of stories. But the stories they told about each other were not the stories they would have told about themselves. The Jews and the Samaritans had their roots in ancient Israel. Both practiced similar religions, but as it's written in the story, almost in a stage whisper, they couldn't even share a cup of water. The Jews regarded the Samaritans as foreigners, descended from colonists. They were seen as unclean and excluded from the temple in Jerusalem by formal edict. The story the Samaritans told about themselves was, of course, rather different. They believed they were descended from the remnant of tribes in the northern kingdom of Israel. They were the bearers of the true faith of ancient Israel. They were strict in observing the Torah, and they worshipped at a shrine on Mount Gerizim, which competed with the temple in Jerusalem. There was tension when some Jews returned from exile from Babylon because the Samaritans opposed the rebuilding of the temple. Perhaps because 160 years before Jesus met the woman at the well, Jewish troops destroyed the shrine so beloved by the Samaritans. There are the stories we tell about ourselves and the stories others tell about us. Jesus and the Samaritan women bring all these stories with them when they meet. But the truth is, both are in need of help. And maybe it's this need that has some wondering, is it a different story ready to be written? Jesus, for his part, is far from home. It's he who in the story is a foreigner. And he's thirsty. It's midday, the hottest part of the day, and he's desperate for water. And the woman, well, it's difficult to know her story, but it seems to me to be shaped by so many losses of one sort or another. We only get part of our exchange with Jesus here today, but if you look again later, you'll hear her talk of five husbands and a sixth man she's with now. Was she bereaved? Was there abuse, relationship breakdowns? We cannot know. But we do know that she chooses to come to the well at a time when she didn't expect anyone else to be there, the hottest part of the day, which perhaps speaks to the pain, the vulnerability she feels. This is, in a real sense, a story of two vulnerable people. Jesus is human and needs water to survive, but he has something to offer also. A spring of living water is how he describes it. Life in all its fullness might be another way, and a deep, deep connection with the God they both worship. The woman's life is never the same again. Her story is rewritten. There are the stories we tell about ourselves, the stories others tell about us. It strikes me today that God is the great cosmic rewriter of our stories. When we think we're done for, God holds a hand out trust in me. When we think we're lost, God turns everything upside down to find us. When we think there's no way out, God points to the empty tomb. And when God gets to write our story, 
the end is, thank God, always just a beginning. Let us pray. Living Lord, we look for a trickle and you offer us a gushing spring. We search for reason, for something to cling to, and you offer us your dying self. We look for peace in the midst of our chaos, and you offer us the quiet of an empty tomb. Saints and sinners, losers and winners, may our love overflow into a gushing spring, not because it's our duty, not because it makes us feel good, but because we want to give not just our offering, but all we have and all we are for you, Lord, and for the kingdom's sake. Amen. I forgot to say earlier that there are teas and coffees today, so stay and warm yourself up and enjoy each other's company if you're able. For now, we're going to sing in 565, My Life Flows On in Endless Song. In 565. serve the Lord. Take with you whatever you have found. Leave behind what you do not need. The blessing of God, Father, Son, Spirit is with you for now and for always. Mm -hmm.